They called him the Diesel. Drink up that Diesel. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, oh, I'm. He leaned across the table and he goes, you need to get me back there. I'll make you famous. And to Riggins, good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone. The 35, the 30, the 20. He's gone. He's gone. It's Rigo the Diesel. This is Rigo the Diesel Uncensored. Conversations with former teammates. John will return next week with a fresh episode. But today, enjoy his conversation with Redskin great Joe Jacoby. All right, my guest today is none other than the great Joe Jacoby, the greatest offensive tackle, as far as I'm concerned, that really ever played, and certainly a guy that belongs in the Hall of Fame. Joe, I, I, I don't really want to talk about that, and I know you probably don't either because you've been through that so many times. I remember years ago when I was playing, and they come around with the Pro Bowl, and I remember guys asking, well, you didn't make the Pro Bowl. How do you feel about that? And it's like, where do you go with that? You can't take it anywhere. It's no. like, well, you'd kind of like to say that, eh, who cares? which is probably the right answer. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you kind of, well, maybe that's a little disingenuous. So anyway, let's talk about the beginnings of Joe Jacoby. And what I, I've always been fascinated because I've never really sat down with a lot of my teammates and really found out all about them. And I appreciate your coming on and giving me an opportunity to do that. You're from Kentucky. Is that where you were born and, and around the Louisville area, I believe? Is Correct. That, that's where you were born and raised in that area? Born and raised there in Louisville, Kentucky. So, uh, you had um, – how many was in your family? Uh, four kids. Four. Uh, older brother. I'm the second child. Sister was third. And then I had a little brother who was fourth, but he passed away when he was about 14. So, Is that right? Yeah. Um, and so your dad worked in the area, I take it? Correct. What did he he do, worked a factory worker. Oh, really? Hobart's. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, yeah. Well, but they make they make the all kinds of machinery and machinery. stuff. Machinery. Like His part was they did the washers, washing machines. So they, they made washing machines. Yeah, I know Hobart's a big uh, in the food industry. Hobart's uh, makes right. A lot they of, had the cutters. Right. And, exactly. For the delis meat. and all that. Exactly. Right. But uh, and he scales did the, and all that stuff. Washing machines. So he did that until. Uh, the multiple heart attacks got him, and he went on disability. So he was basically driving my two little siblings around, my sister and my younger brother, taking care of them. And I guess I was included in that because it's going, I'm seventh, eighth yeah. grade and all that. But, uh, you know, I just watched my father kind of just deteriorate, going from, you know. How not, old was he? He passed away. How old was he when he passed uh, away? Ah, 55. He was 55, yeah. yeah. See, no, it? wait a minute, 56. My mom Is was 55 it? when she passed. Yeah, and I remember in training camp that, yeah. that happened up so, in Carlisle. Uh, you know, he, I watched him just kind of He had being congenital a man. heart disease, I guess, Yeah, right? from being a man, uh, mm-hmm. being you know disability back then in that time frame right. in the 60s and stuff. You know, your manhood was questioned and stuff, and that he kind of felt uh, bad for himself, and I just kind of watched him just yeah. waste away. I can see where that would affect, you know, in other words, his the mental expectations. Psyche and all that. What's that? His mental aspect on that. Where right. He didn't feel like he was providing for his family. Right, that, he's, that he was measuring up the way right. he was supposed to. Yeah, that must have been tough. So when, this first sport you started playing, what was it? It was football. I played, I went to Catholic school. Raised a Catholic, so I went to, to the fourth grade. I tell everybody my knuckles wasn't really from playing football. Rulers, rulers. It was the nuns, man. The nuns was wicked. But uh, I played my brother and I, who's roughly the same size and I, we were on the same team. He but, was uh, two grades ahead of me. So I must have been in the third or fourth grade. And he must have Were you much uh, bigger than the rest of the kids? Like, oh, yeah. I remember. Okay. I can't remember seeing a picture. Of course, you see the pictures. You've got all these little kids. And, and then here's sudden, my brother and I. You know, pop up another foot above everybody. Uh, so from there, and then we moved out of the city. We lived down in downtown. And we moved out from there to the suburbs. Everything was going out that way. Mm-hmm. And I, I started playing again, Youth League, in the seventh grade. So I did that for a couple of years until get to high school. And then I started playing with the high school team. And 
So well, you never you never uh, played basketball. I mean, I no, I did. I was. Oh, so you uh, did play basketball. I with played football. basketball. Real honest, John. Basketball was my first love. I mean, the state that, of that doesn't surprise me. And, and I would imagine you were a pretty slender guy back yeah, in those I was, days. Yeah, I was very you're... slender. I was six, my same height, but I weighed like two thirty-five. If I can. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was. That is slender. I do. I got a picture so of that when, sitting there. So when you went to Louisville to school, right? That's when you, when you, as a freshman, you you enrolled in that. Your, I guess you'd be on your freshman team. You were like what six foot seven and weighed two hundred and thirty five forty pounds. Or college. No, college. College. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I bulked up a little bit. Uh, uh, Tommy, I went through four years of college. I got up to two seventy, two seventy five. And this is where the football starts coming in. I mean, I played that in Louisville. Not a national power that they recognize like right. they are now. Uh, but I got noticed on film because of who we played during the season. We played Pittsburgh, and that year the Pittsburgh champion us on Mark May. Right, they were number one. I and saw them play in Lawrence. They had a great defense. So the defensive players were getting looked at. I got noticed by the Redskins, Bugle, Charlie Castle, and all that. That's how they found me down there. So they came down in January before the draft, Bugs and Cass, and told me, you know, they would like what they saw. Bugles sit down and told me, he goes, if you want to play in it, you got to put get up close to 300, you got to knock your 40 time down, and you got to bench press. I didn't work out, and I didn't yeah. care about Path any of it. Path at least resistance. So I figured, you know, if I'm going to make it, try to give it a shot, I did that for three months. So when they came back, I went from 270 to 295 in April. From January to April, my bench press, you know, everything just increased. So they told me they would have an opportunity. They would be looking at me later. Back then, there was 12 rounds. I said, if they draft me, it would be the 11th or 12th round when they came up. Went through the draft, two days, no phone call, right. nothing. But there is phone calls after the draft's over with. You get all the phone calls for free agent signing. So I'm hearing from Dallas, Cincinnati, Tampa Bay. <laughs> And then look back on it, and the doorbell rings at the house we're living in. My mom's sitting there, and there's a scout from Seattle. So now he's sitting in our living room. He's got a three-year contract. He knocks on the door completely unannounced. Yeah, I didn't know he was even in town. Comes in, so we're sitting there. He's showing my mom. We're looking at the three-year contract with the money and signing bonus and all that. My mom goes, you're going to pay him that? I tell my, the guy's talking. Yeah. Now the phone rings. Washington calls. Well, he's there. That way, he's there. So I take the call. They had a ticket for me at the airport in Louisville. So I take the call. I said, "Yeah, I'm coming up." So I go back. I pack a bag. I told the guy. I said, "I'll let you know." I said, "I'm going up to D.C. to see the Redskins and visit with them." I'll let you know when I get back. So you'd had no contact with Seattle up to this guy knocks on your so door. He, knocks he on just me. drops in. I had no contact with anybody except, except the, the Redskins. Redskins. And so the guy goes, all right. So he's leaving. I'm leaving. He takes me to the airport. <laughs> nice enough guy, right? <laughs> nice guy. So he takes me to the airport. And I fly up. He will work for food now. He's yeah, the, I don't know where he's at. The he probably didn't They're come off the he interstate. He probably didn't last long after that. But <laughs> well, once you started making all pro, I'm sure that they. What the hell? So now I get up here. It's Joe's first year. So Joe's in there meeting at her. Uh, you know, back then, there's probably 50 guys running around Redskin Park. At least to fill out the rest of the roster because they bring, what, 120, 125 guys to camp. So really they were looking for the rest of the, They didn't really invest in dummies. They just invest in people. The hope was to be the dummies right. for blocking. And all. That, that was one of those. So You've probably been down that road in college. When yeah. you first get to college, you got college, to do something that does it. Well, I'm gonna take, we're going to take a little bit of a break <laughs> right here, and then we're going to come back. And uh, as Paul Harvey used to say, Joe's going to tell you the rest <laughs> of the story. Did you know that your Washington Redskins are sponsored by Coke Industries? That's K-O-C-H, Coke. Their 67,000 U.S. employees make a lot of things that make game day better. Greener turf? They make that. Stronger paper products for tailgating? They make that. Oh, and electric components in TVs and smart devices? So you can watch the Redskins anywhere. Yeah, Coke makes that too. See all they make for on and off the field at kochmakesthat.com. 
you're ready to drive again. Enjoy the open road with confidence and powerful performance of a new Honda. From stylish turbocharged sedans like the Accord and Civic to rugged all-wheel drive SUVs like the CRV, HRV, Pilot, and Passport. The safety features like Honda Sensing, including a collision mitigation braking system, adaptive cruise control, Honda Lane Watch, and more. Get a great deal on your favorite Honda. Contact your local Honda dealer for more information or visit Washington area Honda Dealers.com. John? I got a little message for everybody, as obviously you can see. O'Connor Plumbing, O'Connor Plumbing. And next week, if you don't like the fact that I wore a hat today, I will be happy to go with the uh, light socket hair that I had last week. <laughs> anyway, we all know money's going to be tight in the near future, and you can't wait when you have a plumbing problem. So what's O'Connor Plumbing going to do for you? No payments for six months on all services. Get quick on the spot credit approval. Convert to a long-term 120-month low-rate APR loan afterwards, plus waive diagnostic fees and 10% on, off on all services. Don't neglect your plumbing. It's the heart of your house. Call O'Connor Plumbing at 1-833-RIGGLE-44. Ladies and gentlemen, stand back and watch the Phoenix rise from the ashes. Stand back. It's Riggle the Diesel. All right. We are joined today by uh, the all-time great offensive tackle for the Washington Redskins, as far as I'm concerned, the National Football League, Joe Jacoby. Uh, Joe, go ahead and continue your story upon it based on the fact that uh, your first arrival here in Washington and what ensued after that. So get here, talk to Joe in the room. They bring the guys in to talk to Joe. Joe thought I was a defensive lineman. Somebody had informed him, the next guy you're seeing plays on the defensive line. So Joe going through, about 10, sitting in there for about 10 minutes, and Joe's explaining where I Is was. Is this in his office, just you and him? Yeah, where I would fit into the scheme with Dave Butts and everything playing defensive tackle. Well, I never corrected him. I never yeah, said no. I would have done true. the same thing. I, I just sit there, kept quiet. Nothing good's going to come out of my mouth. And I don't want to ruin this opportunity. You probably figured that he, in his mind, he had you. You might have been an offensive tackle in college, but he's thinking I'm going to make a defensive right. tackle, right? So you're not going to tell I'm him not going to ruin his it. business. I got you. So I, I, I leave that room, went out, went into Dick Meyer's office. He was with the team back then? He was assistant general manager. God, I forgot about that. Remember him? Yeah. So I signed a two-year contract. They gave me my side of bones check, and I flew home. And then, So back, you'd fly home thinking that you're coming back and you're going to switch to defensive tackle? No, I knew I was playing offense. Joe thought I was defense. Your Joe, head coach thinks you're a defensive tackle. Right. But your offensive coach, Joe Bugle, Joe knows <laughs> he's, you're his coach. I'm his coach. So now you. Joe gets in this. The, the Bugle gets called out later that day by Gibbs because I was the extra guy. Joe was told to bring a certain number of guys. Say it was 15. I was number 16. And Gibbs was trying to get out of the contract that day. But they couldn't get out of it because it was a binding contract and all that. And Coach Gibbs said, well, we're bringing him up here. Go through the mini – remember he had three mini camps yeah, for the new coaching exactly. staff. And we'll cut him, and so he'll get an opportunity somewhere else. Well, that didn't happen either. I go to camp. Mark May, who was the number one draft choice. Oh, I didn't yeah. say I was the brightest individual either. I mean, I didn't research any of this out because they had drafted five. Yeah. They drafted five offensive linemen that year. And All I right. Signed, yeah, I signed I as a free agent. That's well, I, can not think of, I can think of three of them. Oh, actually four. Sayre, Gary Sayre. Yeah, wasn't he one of Oklahoma them? Oklahoma State. Right. And then you had Melvin Jones, Russ, and uh When that may have been six, there was a kid they drafted on the 11th round from the University of Washington. You don't recall his name? Alan I, Kennedy. Don't, I, I, don't I don't remember, remember him. him. So I, I get my opportunity because Mark was holding out for 10 days until he signed. And then they saw, saw what I could do. And, and they got then, more and more impressed. Right. And then – So you actually was never supposed to have a career here. No. Based on the way the number games were. So then Mark out. signs, Coach Gibbs calls me out of the meeting. Oh, and then you're sweating bullets? Well, yeah, I figured, okay, number this one draft it. choice. I said, they're going to get rid of me. I'm on my way out of here. He's going to at least give me a chance to catch on somewhere else. 
No, my mom passed away in camp. Oh, uh, yeah. So I left. I wasn't coming back. What do you mean? When you left here, you didn't, I, did you take all your stuff with you? Uh, no, I left most of it here. When you say you wasn't coming back, I'm Well, I get there, you know, you're going through the funeral. It's just my older brother, my younger sister. That's le what's left of our family. And I figured we were a tight-knit group. I wasn't leaving. I'm, we were going to stick together. And you met my brother. Sure. Well, Charlie. He, he and I get in a fight. He goes, you're, you're an idiot. <laughs> uh, well, he's probably correct on that. I wasn't coming back. He kicks me out. He's throwing all my stuff out, the, out in the front yard. Because he stuff. knew that you had a So it was my feet. brother who sent me back. Is that right? Yeah. That's an interesting story. I don't think a lot of people knew that. No, nobody. So, so as they say, the rest was, well, the rest was somewhat history. But somewhat. So you came back. You joined the team, worked your way up. And what I recall, Joe, your rookie year, that you actually started out at right guard, didn't you? Left guard. Left guard. Well, I Russ. thought Salty was playing left guard. No, Russ was. They moved left Russ, guard. or they moved right. Ron. To Russ right from guard. center to left guard, and okay. moved Ronnie back over to the right side. That's it. That's Russ it. had a knee injury, and they moved me in there to start. First game was up in, in Chicago. Chicago. Right. Yeah. So you started out as an offensive guard, and I, if I'm not mistaken, you know the number one draft pick. I don't think he saw the light of day that you were looking at. It was, well, no, he, in, he was still playing left tackle, and that's when they made the move one or two weeks after I started left guard. Oh, and, and I, then you guys flip-flopped? And then I went to left tackle, and then Mark, they eventually moved over to the right side at right guard, and I played left tackle until they moved me. And when, then yeah, and Jimmy got here, and then Jimmy couldn't only play but one side. So you moved I over moved to the right again. tackle. Yeah. So you got around. You know, from the classroom – to the sidelines, from the chalkboard to the vocabulary words, whether you're a pro football coach or Mrs. Johnson at George Mason High School, the Washington Redskins believe in the power of great teachers. That's why we're partnering with youth entrepreneurs to bring DC teachers the resources they deserve. In response to the coronavirus pandemic, Youth Entrepreneurs has launched Teach Everywhere, a place for teachers to call home while adjusting to teaching at home. The resource contains distant learning activities, resources and tools, and a series of webinars from expert educators. Visit teacheverywhere.org to learn more. And 75 tons of game day trash and recyclables need to find a home. So when the final whistle blows, our team hits the field. As an official partner of the Washington Redskins, RTS is connecting FedEx Field with Smarter Way Solutions to ensure a more sustainable and responsible approach to what's left behind at the end of a game. RTS a better waste company. Find out more at rts.com. And stay up to the minute with all the Redskins news this offseason. Download the official Washington Redskins mobile app. Geographic and device restrictions apply. Data charges may apply. Riggins. He's going to go all the way. Unless Blackwood can catch him and he can't. They left the scoreboard up. I remember seeing Redskins 27, Dolphins 17. And it was that moment of truth where I went, damn, I'm a world champion. John, when he walked, he had a little bop to him. And besides that, he had the booty out there. They nicknamed him Chocolate Chip. Story time with Rigo. When you look back on your career, Joe, um, what's some of the stuff that sticks out in your mind? I, you know, you went to... You went to four Super Bowls, which right. is incredible, I think. I mean, there's not many. I, 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 I was fortunate enough to go to two, basically because of you and Russ and Jeff and Donnie. And um, who am I leaving at? Bosco. As, as the four guys, that uh, that's incredible if you ask me. I don't think – I would have to think, do you know? I mean, I think you guys are unique. Basically, the only thing missing would be, um, you know, from one side of the line all the way out, you guys were in all four Super Bowls. Right. You know, just say we moved to the left. With, you had, you had uh, Jeff, and then you had Russ, you, and Donnie Warren, if you know, if you just happened to run the situation, you know, your formation in that direction. Um, get back to my original question. The, what of the four Super Bowls you played in, is there any one game that sticks out in your mind more than the others? Well, they all have their special memories from each each one. I, I would say the first one you and I played in. And the reason I say that, I mean, that rookie year in camp when I lost my mother, mm -hmm. 
that game was played on her birthday. Is that right? Uh, so it was one year after all that. We ended up w winning it. Uh, you know, what we went through, that strike year and everything like that. You know, and I look back on that. This is me going off a thing. I, I, I get Hopefully. upset with it. It bothers me in those years that we play, those strike years, and they they put asterisks by them. And they they demean them. They don't think they w were worth, you know, that we were worth what we we did on that game. To be honest with you, you got to look at the individuals involved, the coaching staff all the way down. We overcame a lot, more than the other teams involved in, to win those games. I hear all this stuff. They talk about how difficult it is to win every year, you know, all the things right. that go on. And look what we overcame. Not once. We did it twice. Right. But we get looked down upon because it was a strike year. I think we should be looked upon because of how the odds and the adversity we overcame greater than a normal year. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of uh, truth to that. And uh, the actual, what, what really proves your point is, though, and that's what I think most people would recognize, is that it would be one thing if it were a fluke. Right. Meaning that, okay, you played, what, nine games that year, I right. think it was, and you get into this tournament kind of what they called it back then and you win all four games you're the you're, you know you're the Super Bowl never champion went back. exactly and then that's the end of it one hit wonders right but it's pretty evident that that was the beginning the foundation of something that was going to be as a you know a dynasty if you will that would last you know a good 10 years Correct. I was going to ask you about that Super Bowl game because me I had been there for so long I think that this was my 11th year in the NFL I had really never even made one playoff game when I was my first year here in D.C., and we just got throttled by the Minnesota Vikings up in Minnesota who went on to the Super Bowl. I mean, that team was on life support when it got to the playoffs. There was no chance really that it was going to go anywhere. So I knew nothing of the playoffs. To go out there at that part of your career, when I got in the game, the one thing I just wanted to do was, was an opportunity to play in the Super Bowl. Here you'd come the year before, well, two years, however you want to, you know, you were actually a second-year player now, just out of Louisville, so to speak, went through your rookie year. And, you know, you played a team, I believe that team, the Pittsburgh, uh, the, uh, Pittsburgh Panthers, I think they are, right? Uh, what do you call it? Russ's old. Oh team. yeah, yeah. University. University. Yeah. I think they won the national championship that year that you played. I, I them. think you're correct. I know they did. When the year I said, yeah, it was because it was 1980. I remember Pittsburgh came to Lawrence, Kansas, right. to play, and I'm sitting up on the hill there watching a game, and they were the, they ended up winning the I think national they had championship. Eleven, eleven guys drafted. Yeah, exactly. Like that. But what I was going to say to to come from that, you know, uh, from your background and some, you know, uh, like it was for me. I mean, I grew up in a little town of 500 people in Centralia, Kansas, and all of a sudden you're thrust into this, the dream that you had for it to turn so quickly to go from college to the Super Bowl. That must have been, you know, a little bit like, was there moments when you were out in California going, is this really happening? Time well, I mean, uh, uh, doing something now with my youngest daughter, a, a book thing she wants to write. So she wanted me to relive that moment. And when I did, I'm thinking, okay, uh, it is kind of a surreal moment. Here's a kid that nobody wanted, what one team that talked to him, wasn't drafted, all that stuff. And now I am flying in a helicopter to do one of those 7 a.m national news that things in the morning and over LA I'm 23 years old I'm thinking wow yeah this is surreal then I get there of course you would have been the same way I mean they had this huge spread of food you know the champagne I'm like let's go <laughs> so I mean well, you probably hadn't slept yet had you no we didn't then we had to fly yeah. back we flew out that morning but uh, I I think about that, I mean, because two years before that, mm -hmm. I mean, and then, my head coach wanted to cut me. <laughs> yeah, that's what's amazing. Yeah. And you build a Hall of Fame career out of all that. But you know what? That's a whole. That's the story of the underdog. You know, that's the part that everybody loves, right. I think, about this country and about the fact if you get a chance, the people that really take advantage of it, and you clearly were one of those people, you mm -hmm. had the goods. Joe, you got to come back. we got to do a part two. Thank you I so much do. for joining right, me today. You. Always good to see you. And you too. That's it. 
We will see you next week, and who knows who we'll have next week. But once again, thanks to Joe Jacoby for joining us today. Even though COVID-19 poses an unprecedented challenge, you can count on Novec to deliver reliable power and to help in other ways. Novec.com offers tips to save energy while spending more time at home. Novec customers can monitor their energy use online, as well as pay bills through the website or by phone. And anyone can donate to help neighbors in need through Operation Roundup. Novec, power you can count on. I'm Robert Wilkie, Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. 155 years ago, President Lincoln called upon us to care for America's veterans. Today, you can help answer that call. We are looking for physicians, nurses, and other medical professionals to help protect veterans from the coronavirus. Go to va.gov slash join us or text VA physician or VA nurse to 97211.